Um, I'm really excited to be here today to talk a little bit about my pathway in science and also the past, present, and future of CRISPR. And I want to take this opportunity to talk a little bit about my background and pathways into science, the different moments that really brought me to working on this exciting field of genome editing. And then one of the things that I want you to take with you tonight is to be flexible and open with your goals and not to lock them too specifically and too soon. Because when I was your age and deciding what I wanted to do, CRISPR gene editing was basically science fiction. And um, 10 to 15 years from now, when you get to where I am, CRISPR might be a thing of the past and you might be working on the next big thing. So I want to give you a sense of my pathway so you can forge your own unique way and hopefully be uh, giving this talk to others like you in the future. Uh, but don't worry, we'll talk plenty about CRISPR. Start where it all started for me. And this is in San Jose, Costa Rica. This is where I was born and raised. And it was a really cool environment to grow up in. Costa Rica has about 5.1 million people. Uh, it's also the country of Pura Vida. Pura Vida means pure life. And that's really a way of living um, where we are really connected to nature. It was a great place to be connected to uh, volcanoes, the beach. Um, it was really an awesome place to be and to grow up and to be kind of connected to science uh, just every day. And then one of the people that really kind of was a big role model for me growing up was Dr. Franklin Chan Diaz. He's the first astronaut born in Latin America and he was born in Costa Rica. So for me growing up in a small country like Costa Rica, uh, sometimes we have these mental barriers where we think uh, big discoveries and big dreams can only happen in big places like the US. But seeing someone who uh, was born and raised in Costa Rica be able to go to space, what bigger dream or bigger goal is there than that? So for me, that was really um, a giant role model uh, in my life and someone who showed me that if he can go to space, then I can also pursue my own dreams. And then what really got me more into genetics was Dolly the sheep. And uh, many of you are probably too young, uh, well, definitely too young to remember this. Uh, I was about eight years old when this happened in 1996. And it was really an exciting time for me uh, because I was eight, I didn't understand what genetics was. I didn't understand cloning. I didn't understand DNA, but I remember being so impressed by the idea that you could copy an entire animal. And that really kind of, um, stuck with me as I continued growing up and thinking about what I wanted to do. And then the other thing that uh, um, really was exciting in the 90s when I was growing up and when I was going to middle school and high school was HIV and the search for a vaccine and a cure. HIV was, the pandemic was really uh, strong in the 90s. There were no cures, no, no good treatments. And there was this idea that we were going Gonna create a vaccine that was gonna prevent people from getting HIV. And we still haven't gotten to the vaccine or the cure, but uh, studying HIV throughout decades has really opened up a lot of new inventions um, in biology and has made biology really exciting as well. So uh, growing up in the 90s, seeing HIV really was something that made me think, okay, one day I wanna work in the cure of this disease. So then um, with all that in mind, when I finished high school in Costa Rica, I was able to obtain a scholarship that uh, let me go to Germany, to the Technical University of Munich to study. And I decided to study physics um, because I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And I thought physics would really allow me to kind of uh, get the broadest uh, training and then also allow me to decide within physics what areas I wanted to go into. I knew I wanted to work in human health, but I didn't know from what angle, whether it was from engineering or from the biology side. So physics really kind of provided that foundation for me. Um, this is a picture of the Technical University of Munich, the math department where I spent a lot of time in my first years. You can see there's this really cool slide that even professors use to go from the fourth floor to the first floor. And I spent a lot of time sliding on the slides. Um, and then what I, um, one thing that I wanted to highlight 
highlight here is um, don't let early failures define the rest of your studies or your career. My first year as an undergrad in college, I did really poorly. I didn't pass any of my courses. I had six courses that I did not pass. Um, but I didn't give up. I knew that um, I could do it. I had people tell me I should change majors. I should do something different, but I was pretty stubborn. Um, and there were times where I thought about giving up, but I think it's important to remember that really this early failures do not define the rest of your studies. So if you don't do uh, well from the get-go, that's not an issue. You should still continue if you believe that's what you wanna do. And then the other thing that I, I realized uh, early on is that um, I did not enjoy courses. So pretty soon I was looking for opportunities to do research because I wanted to do something more practical. I wanted to understand how the things that I was learning um, in class could be connected to doing something with my hands and doing something where I was researching new uh, cool things. So this took me to the field of DNA origami and I joined the lab working uh, in this field. And it's pretty cool if you look at this smiley here, this is made completely out of DNA. So this is, uh, if you look at this one, this is a little bit more creepy, all the smileys with distorted faces, but it was a really cool space to think about DNA, not as a carrier of genetic information, but as a building block. And I just have here the quick principles of DNA origami to give you a sense of what this, uh, what this technology is and some of the potential it has. So the way DNA origami works is pretty much using the base complementarity of nature. So if you have a single strand of DNA and you want to bring, for example, these two parts together, you can create what's called a staple, which is just a second piece of DNA that has complementarity to this part and to this part. And if you mix them together, this will create a little loop here. So if you can imagine a lot of these staples or a lot of these pieces of DNA that you throw into a big mix, um, you can create all kinds of structures like this rectangle here. And what's really cool is that you can really create not only squares, you can create smileys, you can create stars, you can create boxes, um, which I think is one of the most exciting things. You could imagine drug delivery mechanisms where you use these boxes to put medicines in it and take them to different places in the body. But you can also create robots like this one here, this dancing robot that uh, can move and open its legs and move its arm a little bit. So it's a really cool field. But um, one thing that I was craving was going back a little bit to my um, to human health and thinking about, okay, this is really cool, but how does this apply to uh, human health? How can we use these tools to really improve people's health? Um, so with that in mind, I applied to scholarships in different countries and uh, I applied to scholarships in the US, scholarships in the UK. I applied to uh, job opportunities in terms of research here as well as in the US. And I applied to maybe 20 places and only got one, uh, one acceptance at the University of Cambridge uh, with a very young um, principal investigator who gave, gave me the opportunity to come and his work was really focused on epigenetics and DNA or organization. So if you think about each cell in your body, each cell has over two meters of DNA. Um, not sure how much that is in feet, I think around six feet. But uh, what's really impressive is if you think about two meters of DNA, uh, they, it has to be folded in a very specific way within six micrometers of the diameter of the nucleus in order to be functional. functional. And then what I learned going to the UK is this entire field studying DNA organization uh, called epigenetics, where one of the ways DNA is packaged within the nucleus is by wrapping around these proteins called histone proteins. And um, some of you might know that DNA is negatively charged. Histone proteins are positively charged, which keeps it all compacted. And then what's really cool about the system proteins is that they have these tails that come out and you can actually put chemical modifications on this tail to either make uh, the histone more positive or more negative or more neutral. Uh, this kind of changes how compact 
the DNA is in different regions. Um, but I thought this was really cool and I wanted to learn a lot more about this field. So I applied to PhD programs across the US. I think I applied to maybe 15 programs and only one program accepted me at the University of Pennsylvania. And one of the reasons uh, that they were interested in my profile is because they have a big epigenetics institute here. So I decided to go here to start my PhD, I think in 2013. It's, it's been a while now. Um, and really the question that fascinates me and the one I wanted to study was how from a single genome, from a single uh, DNA that you have in each of your cells, we can get over 200 different cell types. How from a single fertilized egg, we can get not only over 200 different cell types, but this are really different epithelial cells in the skin, nerve cells, immune cells, cardiac cells, bone cells. They all have such different properties and uh, what really determines why each cell has this property and how they make it. So one of the things that we know uh, or we already knew is that one of the reasons these cells are different is basically what proteins they express. But what's really interesting from a DNA perspective is that only about two to 3% of your DNA really encodes for proteins. Um, the reason they're different is because uh, of the proteins that they're expressing. But then thinking about the DNA in each of your cells, only two to 3% of the DNA really encodes for proteins. The other 97 or 98% for a long, long time was called junk DNA because we didn't know what it did and we thought it was just spacer between genes. But now what we've learned, uh, especially in the field of epigenetics is that over 80% of that non-coding DNA is believed to be important for regulating gene expression. So this green 80% regulates uh, which of these proteins are being expressed or not. So that's really uh, one of the areas that I focused on during my PhD, which is on enhancers, a type of non-coding regions of DNA that regulate uh, cell type specific expression and maintain cell identity. Uh, this sounds pretty complicated, but what we can see here, for example, is we see a specific gene or protein that's expressed both in the brains as well as in the limbs. Uh, but we don't know what's regulating that expression and why it's only localized to these two different tissues. Uh, and then the idea is that there are these pieces of DNA called enhancers that can be bound by specific proteins called trans transcription factors that bind DNA. And then this binding leads to this part of the DNA coming towards where the gene starts and leading to expression of that gene. And then in the brain, as well as in the limbs, this happens through different enhancers. And then one of the ones that I was specifically looking at is P63. This is a transcription factor or a protein that binds uh, specifically at these non-coding regions. And it's important for uh, maintaining epithelial identity. Uh, people have done experiments where they got rid of this protein in mice, and you can see that the mouse doesn't develop properly. It doesn't have uh, um, hair follicles like here. It doesn't have eyelids. It doesn't develop uh, limbs. And then in humans, we know that mutations within this protein, P63, can lead to really severe mutations like craniofacial malformations, limb malformations, uh, fused eyelids, skin erosions. And something that's uh, common between these two different uh, diseases uh, from the same protein is that these patients have clefting of the lip and the palate, which actually is one of the most common uh, defects uh, in the world. One in 700 newborns has clefting of the lip and palate, and you might be familiar with people who have it. Um, so this, a lot of my work during my PhD was focused on understanding genetic factors that lead to uh, this disease, and then also factors related to how DNA is organized. Uh, but during my time in my PhD, I also wanted to think broadly about how science uh, contributes to society and how science uh, is it's important for finding new uh, therapies, but also can do much more than that. So I founded the Penn Science Diplomacy Group, 
uh, during my PhD. And this is a group that fosters collaborations that cross borders. If you think, for example, uh, about a global pandemic like COVID, you need a lot of uh, governments to come together um, to coordinate a response to something that's threatening us across different borders. But then also, if you think about the Cold War and the US and Russia relationship uh, during that time, one of the only channels that we had for bilateral relations was science and working, for example, in a space uh, agency and space program. And then the second thing that I uh, was working on and that I encourage any uh, Spanish speakers to uh, look up is a podcast called Caminos en Ciencia. And this is a podcast uh, completely in Spanish where we interview people all across Latin America, as well as uh, Latin Americans or Hispanics uh, living in the US about their pathways uh, into science and how they uh, were able to become scientists and then what they're doing nowadays. And really what we want is to um, kind of provide those role models like the one that I had in Franklin Chan Diaz, uh, the astronaut for people who come from different parts of Latin America to not only see themselves as scientists, but also to understand, okay, what are the unique challenges that um, people within our community face in, on their paths towards becoming scientists. So uh, feel free to look it up, Caminos en Ciencia on Spotify, um, as well as the podcast app. And then I also wanted to highlight, um, especially in this time of COVID, there has been a big loss in trust uh, around science and scientists. So there really is, I think, a need to increase trust in science. And I think some of the ways that we can do this, and I encourage you to think about this as you start your own pathways, is to first improve science communication. Um, a lot of times we do science for other scientists, but we don't think about communicating it to the public, even though a lot of the science that we're doing is funded by public taxes. And then I think it's really imperative to increase diversity in science. Um, we need to have people who look like us or who come from our communities represented in science, not only so we can see ourselves there, but also so they can advocate for us uh, and make sure that new technologies are made accessible for all communities and also respect uh, the boundaries of each community. And then the last one is, I think we ha have to do a better job of allowing and accepting uncertainty. Um, we think that we're really good at it as scientists, but um, I think there is still a lot that we can do in this area to improve it further. But with that, I'll uh, continue with um, CRISPR and DNA. So when you think about DNA uh, and what it controls, it really controls a lot more than uh, people think, for example, fear of heights, uh, cheek dimples, cilantro taste aversion. Um, and, and this might be, some of you might be familiar with that soapy flavor that uh, you might have. And this is often uh, connected to a genetic mutation that people might have. Um, let's see some other ones, for example, earwax type. I think this is one of the most interesting ones that I discovered with my wife. Um, my wife has um, wet earwax and I have dry earwax and I didn't know that was a thing until we got together. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, but then that's also genetic. And, and then freckles, finger length ratio, fear of heights. But then it also controls not only traits, but also diseases like cystic fibrosis is one of the most common in Ashkenazi Jewish and European populations, also as Hispanic and Latinos. Uh, and some of these other ones are also very common. For example, hypercholesteremia can also be connected to genetic mutations and variants. And this brings me back to CRISPR. Um, and this is really one of the most exciting areas in terms of biology at the moment. Um, and it, it actually turned 10 years old, CRISPR gene editing does this past week. So it's been 10 years of a lot of really exciting changes um, with CRISPR. 
All right. So to after my PhD, I was thinking a lot about what I wanted to do. And uh, CRISPR had emerged around 2012. I finished my PhD around 2019. CRISPR had already matured into a really exciting technology. And I wanted to be part of it. But to um, learn more about it, so I applied to the lab of Jennifer Doutna, who you can see here um, in 2019, and um, I was really fortunate to be able to join her lab and start doing research on CRISPR. So CRISPR stands for uh, Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. And because of this really long name, we never say it. We always just say CRISPR. This video uh, of CRISPR. So right here, we have this bacteria that are these uh, brown rods. And they're being infected by this virus that's called bacteriophages that infect bacteria. Uh, so this is really cool. Uh, bacteria, like all living beings, like humans, can be infected by viruses as well. So here, this specific pink virus is injecting it's uh, genetic material into the bacteria. Um, in this case, it's injecting DNA. So then um, if the bacteria, like the one in this uh, video, has a CRISPR system, it can cut out a little piece of the DNA from this intruder and uh, paste it into a specific area in its own DNA. And this area is called CRISPR DNA. And this really acts uh, a little bit uh, like a library uh, where it stores all these little pieces of DNA from foreign invasions that it's had in the past. And then it can also act as a way to protect the bacteria from future invasions from that same intruder. And I'll show you how it does it. So when there's a new uh, infection, uh, the DNA is converted to RNA. It cuts it into little pieces, each corresponding to a different pathogen or a different virus. And this all can get, uh, we add a tracer RNA, which allows it to load onto this protein called Cas9, which acts really as a mas machine that's surveying the entire bacteria to see if any of the intruders actually have a sequence that corresponds to that previous sequence. So if it finds the sequence of that uh, virus, it can bind to it and create a double-stranded break. So you can see here. And then many of these double-stranded breaks then lead to um, killing that foreign virus, which leads to protecting the specific bacteria from this invasion. And that's actually really cool. It's a uh, really interesting immune system, very different from our human immune system. And then I have uh, another analogy here that might make it a little bit more clear how powerful CRISPR is. If we think about the human genome, it has about 3 billion uh, bases. If we were to paste this on, on Word, uh, Times New Roman 12, we would cover over 1 million pages. So imagine, 1 million pages just of these uh, letters and bases. CRISPR has the ability to go into that 1 million pages. And not only that, but it can also go through each page and look for a specific sequence of 20 bases. And it can uh, almost anywhere within that 1 million pages identify it and cut at that specific site. So if you think about editing like a video, for example, one of the first things that we have to be able to do is cut. Uh, so then you can paste different things together. And that's really the exciting thing that CRISPR achieves. And this is also why in 2020, the Nobel Prize of, in Chemistry went to my former boss, Jennifer Doudna, as well as Emmanuel Schalkin Kiev for the development of a method for genome editing. It's also the first uh, team, uh, female team, completely female team to win the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, which is also very exciting. And then um, here, just to really summarize two of the key things that they did um, in, that made them earn that uh, Nobel Prize is first, uh, there's this CRISPR RNA, which is the RNA that uh, the bacteria can target. And the tracer RNA, as I mentioned, is a piece of RNA that allows it to load onto uh, CRISPR-Cas9. 
And then what the first thing that they were able to do is they just connected both RNAs to make it more simple. And this is called a single guide RNA. And then the second part that they did is they discovered that they can switch this blue part for pretty much any sequence that they wanted, uh, making this a programmable, programmable um, cutting machine that can go cut at specific sites. And then uh, if you don't believe me, here is a uh, atomic force microscope image of Cas9 cutting DNA in real time. And you can see this is pieces of DNA. This is CRISPR-Cas9. Um, and you'll see the cut pretty soon. Here, you cleave the DNA, the DNA kind of became separated. And now in this space, uh, we're able to introduce something new. And this is um, yet another video showing you how this would look like, for example, in a human cell. So in this cell, we are, um, sorry, we are zooming into the nucleus and here you can see all the DNA wrapped around the histones. Uh, here we have CRISPR-Cas9 looking for a specific sequence uh, and just surveilling the entire sequence of the genome. Here, this is our target sequence, and we can see Cas9 identifies that sequence uh, and creates a double-stranded break here. And what's really cool here is that we can now see, for example, one of the applications that we can use it for is we could insert an entire new piece of DNA into this sequence um, just after we've created that double-stranded break. And this really happens using just the machinery within the cell itself. So that's pretty cool. And then uh, one of the questions that we often get is what can be edited? Um, and the question, uh, the answer really is if it has DNA, we can edit it. Um, for example, mice have been edited using CRISPR, frogs, uh, zebrafish, Drosophila, flies, um, B. elegans, um, yeast. These are all models uh, in the lab that maybe some of you will start working with once you start doing research because they're very common. But what's really cool about CRISPR is that it's already been used to edit over uh, 288 species of both plants as well as uh, animals. And then, um, as Klaus Gustafsson mentioned, CRISPR really is a toolbox with diverse applications, and this really opens completely new possibilities. It can be in animal models to create uh, models that are more similar to human disease. Uh, we can think about uh, creating better food, for example, corn that can uh, survive really dry uh, conditions, corn that can grow for, uh, in a desert, for example. We can think about gene surgery or uh, eliminating genes that have a high propensity for breast cancer, for example, and replacing them for uh, variants that do not. Um, and it's already been used. This is from 2014. And since then, it has been used in all of these different fields. This is also somewhat of an outdated uh, CRISPR toolkit because this is from 2018 and the field moves incredibly fast. But uh, aside from CRISPR-Cas9, which is the one that I've talked about the most, we now have CRISPR-Cas12. We have base editors, which are um, a CRISPR system that switches only one base at a time without creating a cut. We have tools like you can add a fluorescent protein to Cas9 and uh, image specific parts of the chromosome. We have activators and repressors that can uh, modulate gene expression without creating cuts. We have ways to edit RNA specifically. So you can think about a disease where uh, instead of having to change the uh, genetic makeup of that cell or that person, you could just change the RNA and this is something that's reversible as well. So it's really exciting. It has a lot of potential and it has already been used, uh, for example, in sickle cell disease, uh, which is a disease where your um, red blood cells have a sickle shape instead of a more round shape. And this leads to a lot of um, blockades where a lot of the sickle cells kind of form clumps. And then this can lead to a lot of pain, a lot of uh, problems with patients with this disease. So in 20, 
Um, well, and this is really an exciting one for CRISPR-Cas9 because it's a single uh, base mutation that makes this cells sickle cell. Uh, and if we could switch this T for an A, we could create a normal round uh, red blood cells. So in 2018, I believe uh, the first patient, uh, Victoria Gray, pictured here, received a CRISPR treatment for sickle cell disease. And I believe since then she hasn't uh, required additional treatments. Before that, she had to go to the hospital multiple times. Um, now she's able to live a relatively normal life after this treatment. And that, that really is an exciting step in terms of translating CRISPR technologies to uh, therapies. And then some other areas, um, the, first, the first time CRISPR was directly injected into the human body, because in the case of Victoria Gray, what was done was cells were taken out of the body, they were edited outside of the body, selected and then put back into the patient. Um, this is the first time in 2021 where uh, CRISPR was directly injected into a patient's eye. And this is to treat a genetic blindness uh, led by mutations uh, in a specific gene. Uh, and this is a blindness that a genetic uh, variant that is found in 10% of people with inborn blindness. Uh, so the results came out, I think, uh, last year already, and they showed some promise in terms of um, being able to treat some of these patients. And then there's a lot more treatments that are coming out. For example, uh, progeria is a disease where patients have um, early aging, and it's a single base that you can switch, for example, using a base editor um, to rescue these um, this symptoms. And this has been shown in mice to be effective. So there's a lot, um, a lot happening in this space, which I think it's really exciting. And then when we think about agriculture, as I mentioned uh, before, uh, we can not only use CRISPR for human health, but also for uh, creating different crops. We know uh, from the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations that um, the global population will likely reach 9.8 billion by 2050. Uh, and this will require a rise by 70% in terms of food production um, uh, we'll need to double the food production to be able to provide food for all this, all the people. And this will come with rising energy prices, depletion of underground aquifers, loss of farmland, increased drought and flooding. Um, so I wanted to present an example here of how CRISPR can be used in agriculture. Cassava is a threatened staple crop in the tropics. And some of you might be familiar with cassava. It's also called yuca in Spanish. And it is to African peasant farmers as rice is to Asian farmers. It feeds nearly 1 billion people annually, about 10% of the world population. Uh, it is difficult to breed because the flowering is somewhat unpredictable. Uh, so why would we edit cassava? One of the reasons is cassava, the same as humans, the same as all li living beings can be afflicted by disease. Here's a disease called cassava brown streak that makes uh, cassava not edible. But we can use genome editing to kind of create protection against this disease and reduce susceptibility uh, to make cassava stronger and more resilient. And then the other factor here is uh, cassava uh, has a lot of cy cyanogens that are produced. So we can use genome editing to create cassava that has a lot less cyanogens to make it safer to eat. And um, if you're not familiar with cassava, maybe you're familiar with bubble tea and the bubbles in bubble tea are made out of cassava. So this brings me to, I think on discussion where I think it's worth thinking a little bit more about it. Um, now we can edit DNA, but what should we edit? Um, should we edit uh, our germ cells so we can eliminate certain diseases from the gene pool? Should we edit um, different organisms like uh, fruits and things that we eat? Should we, for example, get rid of entire populations? Uh, one of the things people are considering using CRISPR for is to eradicate the 
uh, mosquitoes that carry malaria, for example. And that's something that is possible with CRISPR technology nowadays. You can uh, use something that's called gene drive to push a population of mosquitoes towards all being completely male or female. And then with time, that population will disappear from the ecosystem. But that really raises questions about do we understand what are the consequences of eliminating an entire uh, species uh, from our ecosystem? And what are the dangers that we might not know about? And then in terms of human germline editing, this is where a lot of the ethics discussion has uh, been around. When we think about uh, human treatments, most of the human treatments or all of the human treatments that are allowed nowadays uh, using CRISPR are in somatic cells. And then somatic cells are, there's really a world of a difference between somatic cells and germ cells. Uh, somatic cells are non-heritable. It's one individual that is affected. Uh, so it's really contained to that specific patient. When it comes to germ cells, this is heritable. It's the individual as well as the offspring that are affected. And then those genes that are changed in germ cells will become part of the gene pool and will go uh, and can be passed to future generations. So there are many ethical questions uh, around the germline. Um, there are also specific risks, for example, technical risks, philosophical risks, social risks. When we think about technical risks, for example, um, I mentioned before that CRISPR recognizes a sequence of 20 bases. So those sequences could repeat a lot across your entire genome. You have 3 billion bases uh, in your genome. So it's really likely that there will be other sites that are similar and will become cut and you'll change those sites as well. So this is a key risk that uh, a lot of the field has focused on and worked on, but there's still open questions here. Another risk is, um, for example, if you try to edit an embryo, what can happen is some cells become edited and some do not, and you end up with a mosaic um, individual where some of the cells will, uh, be, will carry the disease mutation and others won't, and that is not necessarily better for the patient. When it comes to philosophical risks, uh, how do we think about consent, for example? These are, if you're changing an embryo, that embryo does not get to decide whether they want to be edited or not. Um, there's also religious questions around um, germline editing. And then there's also questions about what is a treatment? What is enhancement? If you start editing everyone to be six feet tall, does being five feet tall uh, constitute a disease or not? Uh, so there's a lot of questions here that it's important to start thinking about as a society and what we think should be acceptable. And then social risks. A lot of these treatments are really expensive and we, um, most people will not have access to these treatments. So there is a clear worry here that um, the inequalities that already exist in society will become not only um, not only around um, access to different things, but also will become uh, coded within the genome. So um, in February of 2017, there was a discussion uh, from the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine to think about how we want to govern or what, how we should regulate human genome editing. Uh, a lot of the focus was on allowing space to edit um, somatic cells and creating treatments in this area, but uh, a complete ban on embryo editing. And that continues to be, I think, the stance, not only in the US, but in other countries. However, uh, in 2018, uh, this uh, scientist, uh, was the first one to announce that he had uh, edited human embryos and that those human embryos had uh, were born as well. So this really took what seemed like a threat and something that shouldn't happen to something that has happened. And now we really have to think a little bit more uh, closely about how do we stop this from happening and why was this uh, particularly uh, 
really bad. Uh, how do we stay away from designer babies and um, people wanting to create or design babies uh, based on specific characteristics? And then, yeah, the last thing that I wanted to mention here is that there is an urgent need to bring down therapy costs. Um, when we think about gene therapy, when we think about genome editing, the costs are really, uh, really high. I think in gene therapy, for example, some of the treatments are about $250,000 for a single patient. So most people will not have access to these technologies. Um, some of the genome editing technologies might cost over a million dollars per patient. Then of equity, how do we think about access to these uh, technologies and how do we bring those technologies to other countries? Those are all key questions that I think we need to start thinking about uh, right now before, um, before it becomes a technology that's only accessible for the 1%. Uh, but I wanted to bring it back to something more positive uh, before I end this part of uh, the talk. And it's that really the possibilities using CRISPR are endless. When we think about basic research, CRISPR has really in the past 10 years opened up so many uh, research directions and questions that we were not able to do before. For example, one of the most interesting ones is how do butterflies um, create their patterns. And we really didn't know how they did it until CRISPR came and allow us to tinker with the butterfly's genome uh, and allow us to identify what are factors that lead to different patterns. So I think that might not be um, something that leads to a treatment in humans, but it's still something that's really interesting and I think worthwhile to study. The other one is how, why do humans work uh, walk on two legs? Uh, or by our bipedal. And that's something that we still don't understand. A lot of people are using CRISPR to kind of introduce genes and mutations in mice to see if they can kind of understand or recreate uh, bipedalism in, in rodents and then understand how we evolved to be able to do this. Then in terms of medicine, as I mentioned, CRISPR really opens up new ther therapies. Uh, and as we think about antibiotic resistance, new drug targets, diagnostics, these are all areas where CRISPR has and is also poised to create even better uh, treatments. And then in agriculture, as I mentioned, we can create more nutritious, uh, disease resistant, climate tolerant crops, especially with the rise of climate change. We need um, new, new technologies and new solutions aside from the policy solutions. Um, and I'll skip this. Uh, one of the things that I worked on during the COVID-19 pandemic was uh, uh, working on COVID diagnostics. And now we can use CRISPR tools to diagnose COVID as well as other viruses in a really quick way. But if you wanna learn more about uh, some of the work that's happening, uh, for example, in the lab of Jennifer Dauta or the Innovative Genomics Institute in California, I encourage you to visit this, this website and get some of the resources there as well as their social media. And I wanted to talk a little bit briefly about some of the research that I worked on uh, around CRISPR. So as I mentioned before, my research has always revolved around DNA from um, creating smileys with DNA origami to epigenetics, understanding how DNA organization is connected to disease to now uh, to then work in, in genome editing. And when I went to Jennifer Downer's lab, the question that I wanted to answer is how do we efficiently and precisely insert large segments of DNA at targeted sites? Um, and this is, if you imagine a really long piece of DNA that we wanna insert here, there's a lot of reasons why we would want to do that. For example, if a patient is missing a piece of DNA, we would want to be able to introduce that piece of his DNA back. Or if a patient's DNA around a gene has a lot of mutations that have a high propensity for cancer, we want to be able to remove that piece of DNA and introduce a new piece that does not have that mutation. And then a lot of new technologies, um, for example, creating cell-cell communication there's a lot of ways in which uh, introducing large segments of DNA can allow uh, some of this research to advance. 
So uh, one of the projects that I worked in during my time in uh, the Doudna lab was thinking about how we could take a really long piece of DNA. And then if you think about something extremely long, uh, the ends of that could be facing in different directions, but you really want to put them into a specific target site that's not that large. So if we could use, for example, DNA origami or my background in this area to kind of create structure here to introduce this piece in a more easy way, this could uh, hopefully increase genome integration. And that was really the work that I was doing. I was taking DNA, I was folding it into very small pieces and bringing the ends closer together to be able to find its target site more easily. And now this is published work that um, I'm happy to send to anyone if you wanna contact me afterwards. But uh, from working on genome editing, uh, uh, this led me to um, think a little bit more about what I wanted to do towards, and this brought me to Bridge Biopharma, where I not only think about uh, basic science around DNA, but we have a uh, we have a big focus around rare diseases and specifically genetic diseases and how we can use uh, CRISPR, gene therapy, small molecules, different approaches to cure or treat a lot of these diseases. Um, so yeah, with that, I wanted to finish.